the votes. I'm going to deal with 30 January 1933, looking forward more than I'm looking back. So if you have questions about origins and causes, those are things that we can discuss more on Thursday in the session. Some items you may want to note. I'm guessing I'm dealing with a group that has various backgrounds in terms of European history. For some of you, this may be old hat. But for your reference, just some terms right up front so that when I come to them, you'll have them. There's only one that you need to learn in German, the fourth term. Anyone ever encountered that one before in course? No. All right. The German pronunciation, Gleichschaltung. It's two words put together. Literally, it means putting into the same gear. It's a term that's used, and I'll discuss this a bit. It's a term that's used to describe the process by which, after 30 January 33, Hitler and his party actually seized power. Because they didn't seize power to begin with. They were handed power as chancellor. But then there was a process of coordination the standard English translation. Literally, again, putting into the same gear. Just German can put words together, not quite infinitely, but if you've ever looked at German, you know that you can get words this long. And this is just the term, the same gleich and schaltung to switch or change. So I'll just give you a second so that you have those. And then we'll work through the various questions that come up as we discuss January 30th, 1933, and the significance, the impact. Since the emphasis of this course is a day that shook the world, this is one of the ten. Am I good to go on, everyone? Anyone need me to wait? One sec. One other comment, the Weimar Republic Again, German pronunciation, W's are pronounced as V's. So that's the explanation for the pronunciation. The Weimar Republic is the republic that was formed after the First World War, formally in 1919, and which was ended with Hitler's takeover in 1933. All right. We start with a man. If we're going to make any sense out of the meaning of this day. Hitler, it's often been said that the National Socialist Party was the Hitler movement. Without Hitler, what happened after 1933 in Germany and the wider ramifications of that, global ramifications, are really unthinkable. It's not a cliche. There was no one else who combined the kinds of approaches to politics and personal giftedness, and I say that advisedly, he had some very specific political gifts. <clears throat> Doesn't mean he wasn't twisted, perverse, and evil. He had specific political gifts. And there was no one else of his generation, certainly in Germany, who could match him. So who was he? Well, he was a charismatic leader, but he started out as a nobody. Very quickly, if you don't know his background, he came from a lower middle class family in Austria. He never finished high school. He was a dreamer. He liked to sketch. He liked to go to the opera as a teenager. He ended up moving to Vienna in his teens and was there in his early 20s. And to survive, he was effectively impoverished. To survive, he painted picture postcards. He moved to Munich just before the First World War, so into German territory from Austria. He did the same things there until war broke out in 1914. With the war, he enlisted. He spent four years at the front, apart from two stretches where he was wounded. Four years at the front as a dispatch runner. And at the end of the war, he really had nothing still. He had no skill. He had no trade. He didn't have the kind of education that would have taken him anywhere. And he ended up learning politics in beer halls. Now, our idea of a beer hall and the German version in Munich after the First World War are quite different. 
beer halls could hold up to thousands in Munich after the First World War. Some of them were beer tents, and there were places of intense political discussion. And he found out that when he stood up and started to speak, he could capture an audience. Now, I need to pause here for a second because we'll never understand this and ask you the question, have you ever been in a large public gathering where a speaker has taken the audience by the scruff of the neck? Anyone had that experience? One? How long ago? 58. All right. <laughs> Who was it? Ethan Baker. Okay. There have been a handful of Canada, interesting, Ethan Baker, you mentioned. It's interesting that the rest of you have Anyone watched the speeches of Obama in the campaigns? If you have, he's good. If you look at Bill Clinton's speeches, you can find the best of those online. He's also very good. He commands, well, I saw the other day, Hillary Clinton commands about $150,000 to stand up and do what I'm doing right now. One time. Bill Clinton about the same. He's made millions of dollars since he left the office of presidency. Simply getting up and talking to people. He commands, he's a presence, he has a charisma that Hitler found out he had. He didn't have the kind of training that would have given him opportunities apart from the political ferment of Germany after the First World War. I should also add that when Hitler gave a speech, once he really established himself in the 1920s, uh, much longer than your average lecture, an hour was very short for Hitler. Two hours was finally getting into his stride. <coughs> Two and a half. Sometimes in his close circle, he would speak for three or four hours. You ask, how is that possible? Who would ever listen to that? It's part of the mystery and the charisma of the man, that he could command that kind of attention. He had a very sharp memory for words. He had a very sharp memory for technical details. And there's lots of testimony from people who heard him speak who were basically swept off their feet. Some fell in love. They were enraptured. Some felt like they had heard a prophetic voice. He came to see himself as a prophetic voice. So when we talk about Hitler, there are four things that I want to highlight that are so essential. In the rough and tumble of beer hall politics, he discovered four things with a set of ideas and so on. The first is that he had a personal destiny. He was convinced that he was fated or destined to leave Germany. And this at a time in the mid-1920s when he was a political loser. He'd just been thrown in prison after an attempt to overthrow the government in Munich in late 1923, believing that if he could overthrow that government, he could take over the central government in Berlin, the capital, and transform Germany. It was a total fiasco, absolute fiasco. It was ludicrous. He was put in prison, but it was there that he dictated his book, Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, as it's translated into English. And he came to the conclusion that he was truly fated or destined to be Germany's savior. So that's number one. Number two, he came with an ideology, with a set of ideas, without which the kind of claim that he had a destiny would have been very difficult to sustain. And that ideology, <coughs> we're going to look at in some detail in a moment, but it combined two things that were normally opposites, part of his political giftedness. The two things were nationalism and socialism. At the time, those two things were in opposition to each other. Socialism was an international doctrine of class across borders. Nationalism, clearly the opposite. He welded them together in a really interesting mix. The other core piece of his ideology, we'll look at aspects of it, was his emphasis, of course, on race, racism, and the importance of living space for national development. Living space being literal territory 
required to be, in this case, the German population. His ideology was rooted as well in a notion of struggle, which I'll come back to. That's the second. Number three, a mission. A specific, clear, unwavering, even when things weren't working, an enormous determination, and a self-appointed mission. That is, he didn't receive it from anyone else. He created it and put it on to unite and purify the German people, overcome internal divisions within Germany, and the peace that he's infamous for to eliminate his political and his racial enemies, those he identified as enemies, of course. So his mission was to save, to be a savior for Germany from the corruption and chaos of the Weimar Republic, and then, crucially, from the Great Depression. It began in 1929. Just a quick comment on this. Germany experienced the Great Depression with a severity that only the United States experienced in comparison. It was the most drastically hit. By 1932, about a third of the workforce was unemployed. The economy had shrunk by about 40% since 1928. It was an absolute catastrophe, a deep economic and social crisis. He was going to rescue Germany, he claimed, from that too. And then he would overcome the external threats. And to do that, he had to demolish the Treaty of Versailles. Has that come up, by the way? Was that one of your days at all? Anything about the end of the First World War? Not so much the end. We had the be the beginning of the First World War. But. So the Treaty of Versailles, which in his view had been a disgrace to Germany, had shrunk its territory, limited its power. He was going to demolish the treaty and restore German greatness. And finally, a movement. The National Socialist Party was more than a party. It had an impetus that came from Hitler himself, since he was its creator, essentially, which combined violence as a political tool, deliberate, explicit violence against political opponents, deliberate attempt to provoke, to intimidate, silence. The party was also, or the movement, had the elements of a grand festival. It was intended to be visible, active, in our phrase, I suppose, or perhaps it's a dated phrase now, in your face, conspicuous. So, marches, rallies, bands, parades, uniforms, flags, armbands, inundate, and if we have time I'll show you some short clips, inundate the public arena with the presence of the movement. It's been said about the Hitler movement and the Third Reich, which was established from 1933, that there was always something going on. It was an activist movement. And then finally, tied to that, a movement that's focused on propaganda. Propaganda of the deed, of the activity itself. Propaganda of posters, of parades. And then in 1933, once Hitler was in office, propaganda as a ministry, as a formal office <coughs> of government to manage information, to manage the image. One of the great things that I'll stress at the end is that National Socialism brings into the public arena, as never before, and now take it for granted, the emphasis on image and image creation.
Hitler's a pioneer. That by way of preface. Now, how did this party get to become the government of Germany in 1933? This is my short background piece. I'll go through it quickly. Again, don't hesitate to stop me if you have questions. The Weimar Republic had a half dozen major parties. No party, unlike our current system, no party formed a government on its own. All governments were coalitions. There were over a dozen of them. They changed frequently. And when the Depression hit, it became impossible to form a coalition government that would actually agree enough to function. Because the crisis split the parties even further. Particularly the left wing or labor parties, the parties of the working class, and those of the middle class and the right wing. So with the parliamentary system deadlocked, the Republic had a president who could, by emergency decree, back a minority government. And that's what happened for several years in the Depression. In that same time, Hitler's National Socialist Movement became the largest single party, never got a majority by itself, but became the largest single party in Germany. In 1932, it won over a third of the popular vote, which was an astonishing achievement given there's a half dozen major parties. But it's still not a majority. In that situation, the president was finally persuaded, persuaded, interestingly, by right-wing politicians, conservative politicians, to appoint Hitler as chancellor on the expectation that once in office, he proved to be a bungler, he'd be a flop, that the power of his movement could be diffused by giving him office. That was, in the inner circle, that was an explicit strategy and expectation. It didn't work out that way, not at all. Hitler surprised virtually everyone. And so we come to that process I refer to as Gleichschaltung. He's appointed by the president on the 30th of January, 1933, to try to bring Germany out of the quagmire of the Depression, <coughs> all its ramifications. What he does is transform Germany, and he does it within six months. It's done with a speed, with a violence, with a focus, which, if you were in favor of it, you could have described as breathtaking, exhilarating. If you were an opponent of it, it was horrifying. It happened so fast. Within one month of being appointed as chancellor, Hitler had suspended the normal constitutional freedoms of speech, assembly, and press so that he could persecute his main enemies, which were communists, those on the left. Germany had a large communist party in this period. His government arrested thousands of political opponents in the first six weeks <coughs> that he was in office. Thousands. Makeshift concentration camps emerged spontaneously from this action. Prisons couldn't deal with them. Within two months, a combination of violence, intimidation, and persuasion, and he was enormously persuasive, he actually got Parliament, with some sleight of hand and keeping the communists away, by a two-thirds majority to vote him dictatorial powers for four years actually done in a parliamentary fashion. And it's a key clue to his success. What he did was parallel tracks, violence and intimidation through his party and the stormtroopers, I'll comment on in a moment, and the appearance of legality. Using the Constitution, as he said, to undermine the Constitution, to destroy it. 
Within two months, all provincial or state governments, as we could call them in the German case, were taken over by Nazis. By July of 1933, all parties had either been smashed, including physical violence, or persuaded to dissolve themselves through intimidation and a bit of carrot. And so by July 1933, a law was passed banning every party but for the National Socialist Party. It is now a one-party state, again with Hitler already possessing dictatorial powers until 1937. That process of coordination or Gleichschaltung continues, it's not just at the government level and at every level of government, it's in the justice system, it's in the administration, opponents are expelled, it's in the police, it's in the education system, it's in social organizations. Sports clubs, choral societies are all coordinated, that is, anyone who opposes National Socialism is forced out. In many cases, of course, these people just change stripes. There was a famous phrase at the time about the influx into the party in the spring of 1933, once it was clear what was coming and that the Nazis really did have power, and that is beef steak Nazis. They were brown on the outside, which is the brown shirts of the SA, but they were red on the inside. They were rare, in other words because they were really communists or socialists at heart, but they'd come along for the ride. It happened in media and culture. The propaganda ministry was established in March of 1933, just weeks after Hitler was appointed. A ministry for propaganda and popular enlightenment, for people's enlightenment. All areas of culture, the press, the radio, art, theater, music, film, literature, if the last there were seven, were coordinated, again, gleichgeschaltet, in a chamber of culture by the fall of 1933. What did it all mean? It meant that you were an opponent of National Socialism, you couldn't practice in those areas. <coughs> and just to give you an illustration of how this worked in the real world and how violence worked, picture yourself here at university. The Nazis won their early majorities in terms of popularity on campuses. Started in the late 20s. Before they got national vote in big terms, students had gone their way. That's a whole interesting question. What was it about national socialism that was attractive to this generation? So, I'm teaching, I'm Jewish. Or, I've been an outspoken opponent of Hitler and what he's doing. It's March or April 1933. Students went from class to class and simply disrupted. I wouldn't be able to teach. Or got violent. Or they went to the administration, upper administration, and protested. Saunders shouldn't be teaching here. Because he doesn't espouse the right values. He's antagonistic to the new Germany. The game is up. What's an instructor, professor, going to do under those circumstances? There's no recourse. The law's not interested. Because at the same time that's happening, it's happening in courts of law. Nazi thugs, members of the stormtroopers, are entering law of courts, literally tossing out, physically expelling Jewish lawyers, Jewish judges, and there's no defense against it. So that's the nature of what happens, and it happens with stunning speed. Again, so that by the summer of 1933, democracy's gone. The rule of law, as we understand it, has been suspended. Hitler then. <coughs> accomplishes, apart from taking control, which was one of his central purposes, he accomplishes also what he said he would do in terms of rescuing Germany from the Depression. 
from that horrible situation in which he came into office in 1932. Within two years, by 1935, the worst of the impact of the Depression had been overcome. It's not all to his credit, and I can't go into details here, but it looked like it was to his credit, and you and I know that today any political leader would take credit for such a success, whether or not they had much of a hand in it. He, of course, boasted continuously of what he had been able to accomplish. For By 1935 as well, he was taking significant steps to dismantle the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, his other big object. He declared rearmament in March of 1935, thus saying null and void to the terms of the treaty which restricted German arms. They weren't allowed to have an air force. Their army was to be only 100,000 men. It wasn't really even enough to police the borders. 1935, he'd already been doing it secretly, but now he announced it. 1936, he remilitarized the western zone of Germany, which had been permanently demilitarized, i.e. no fortifications or troops, as a safeguard for France and Belgium against another German invasion. He unilaterally broke that agreement. The Germany did agree to that one. He broke that agreement, marched his troops into the Rhineland, in 1936, in March, he recognized that if Britain or France had opposed him, he would have had to back down, but they didn't. They protested verbally, but they didn't do it. So he was restoring German greatness domestically and on the international scene. It's an astonishing achievement. I should say that in the mid-1930s, if you're not aware of this, there were a lot of Hitler admirers not just in Germany. A lot of Hitler admirers. Astute people who thought he's done something that no one could have imagined. And if you go fast forward a couple of years to 1938, when he took over Austria, incorporated it into Germany to form a greater Germany, it's often been said that if he had been if he had died or been assassinated in 1938 or 1939, he would have gone down in history as one of the greatest Germans. Um, you probably, if you talked about the origins of the First World War, said something about Lloyd George, who was British Prime Minister in the First World War. He met with Hitler in 1936, long not in office anymore, Lloyd George, but he met with Hitler in 1936, and he came away saying Hitler was the greatest living German. This movement, I just want to pause for a second because I said I wouldn't talk about National Socialism. NSDAP just stands for National Socialist German Workers Party. It's a very interesting combination of terms. We can just sort of flip past it with our term Nazi, which is just an acronym. Uh, German normally takes the first two letters of word to get their uh, acronyms. So National Socialist, Nationalism and Socialism, he brings together. And it takes us to some key ideas here, that somehow you could have a workers' party, that is a labor party, normally of the left, and socialist, and you could merge that interest with national interest. And from his perspective, what National Socialism meant was socializing the nation. And his famous illustration, what would be the most socialist institution in the country? Anyone guess? For Hitler? The institution that would best reflect socialist values. Unions? Pardon me? Unions? Anyone else? The army. How do you usually think of the army as a socialist? 
That was his imagination, and it tells us an enormous amount about how he thought. Why? Common purpose, common goal, uniform command, <coughs> solidity, commitment, determination. <coughs> that was his socialism. Here's a shot of Hitler, just as I flip past. There he is 10 years later when he's first appointed as chancellor, looking like a dignified statesman. Uh, I mentioned the question of image, and of course, image is central to every portrait that we see. He managed his image. He had a personal photographer who followed him around, took hundreds of thousands of photos, became a millionaire in the process because Hitler's image ended up in coffee table books. The photographer's name was Huffman. Coffee table books, magazines, newspapers it ended up on postage stamps from the end of the 1930s. I didn't bring those images along. He made a fortune crafting and publishing. Let's go to the ideology. Core principles, I've identified three for you. Charismatic leadership, charisma, that very difficult to define quality which captures, commands, has authority to lead. The term pure in German just means leader. It has no, up until this time, it has no mystical connotation of really, not the kind of aura that Hitler was to attach to it. And of course, his entourage, once he was established, referred to him, referred to him in person as my Führer. Mein Führer in German. He believed in the principle of leadership against democracy. For him, democracy was, by definition, weak because it did not identify true leadership. The mass can't lead in his view. They have to be led by the person of destiny and special ability. That is Hitler, in this case. Second thing, race is a criterion for determining value. A criterion for identifying who belonged and who didn't. Separating between members of the national community and those who were outside what he called the national community. Ultimately, as we know, race was a central criterion for determining who deserved to live and who, in his view, deserved to die. Third piece that I mentioned in passing earlier, struggle. It sounds innocent enough, but struggle is at the core of Hitler's view of the world. It's a struggle first to identify enemies, it's a struggle against those enemies, and we're talking domestically now, those at home, and then it turns into international struggle, which of course is a code word for war. War doesn't happen for Hitler because of specific conflicts. Those are symptoms of the fact that life is struggle. And I can pop ahead. This is in the reading that you're doing. This is just a very short piece from it. And this captures, that reading is really interesting in the way it begins with a kind of philosophical preface for his economic goals, politics of the conduct in the course of the historical struggle of the life of peoples. The aim of these struggles is the assertion of existence. It might sound innocent enough, but it's to be or not to be. It's existence or annihilation for Hitler. It's either or. It's all or it's nothing. Hitler's ideology was rooted in a specific view of history. All history, in his view, was about national or racial struggle 
And that stood in opposition to the famous phrase of Marx. Does anyone know it that opens the Communist Manifesto? All history is the history of... That's interesting. So you haven't encountered the Communist Manifesto yet. Famous open words, all history is the history of class struggle. Marx, too, had a formula to make sense of the entire sweep of human history. Hitler turned it on its head. He said, no, it's not. All history is the history of national racial story. So we use the same verb, but different actors. It's a very simple formula, but has massive consequences in the real world. And Hitler was a man of consequences. He boasted about his fanatical pursuit of his bedrock ideas, his core ideas and values. So he divided the world into nations and races who were creators or builders of civilization, and nations and races, on the other hand, who were destroyers or parasites of civilization and culture. Black and white world, or white and black world. And history is about the struggle between those two, national struggle and racial struggle. National struggles we're aware of in terms of war between national groups. That is part and parcel of modern history with the emergence of modern nations in the 19th century. Racial struggle, in the way he formulated it, is something new in the world. Conceived this way. Because it's a war, either existence or annihilation. And of course, behind it, the racial destructive principle he associated with the Jews. He identified everything that was negative corrupt, parasitic, destructive with Jews. They became his principle of negativity. He believed that Marxism, that false belief, democracy, another false belief, capitalism, all these things were plots by the Jews. It's an enormously sweeping and, of course, ridiculous claim, historically, but he projected it as his key to understanding human history. I should note here that in the period in which he did this, in the interwar period, anti-Semitism and racism, not his racism, per se, but racism, were widespread. Not a German phenomenon alone, or phenomenon of North America too. Those of you who studied this know. What did it mean in practice in this period for Hitler? It meant programs to sterilize or euthanize, so-called mercy killing, persons who did not contribute constructively, who could not contribute constructively to the nation. First, before we come to Jews, that meant persons with mental or physical disabilities were sterilized and after 1939 were euthanized, murdered, and murdered by gas in chambers on a model that was to be borrowed subsequently for the mass murder of Jews on Polish soil. In 1942. It also targeted criminals, those who were asocial, asocial, alcoholics, could target homosexuals. So it's a sweeping persecution and aim to eliminate elements of society which are seen to be unproductive or dangerous. 
And then, of course, this racism targeted the Jews. It starts in 1933 with immediate violence, as I described, against Jewish professors, Jewish lawyers, against Jewish businesses. They're forced out of the civil service. They're forced out of the areas of culture. And then in 1935, I put up for you the Nuremberg Laws. Nuremberg is the place where the party had its annual rally in September. And at the 1935 rally were announced a set of laws on citizenship and protection of German blood which legally separated Jewish people from Germans or non-Jews. Marriage and sex were outlawed between so-called Aryans and Jews. Race became a legal category, not just grounds for prejudice and persecution. I put up there the night of broken glass, 9th, 10th November of 1938, when there was a mass wave of violence which was instigated by the party against Jewish businesses, homes, and synagogues. About 7,000 businesses were destroyed. About 100 Jews were murdered in the violence. And about 25,000 male Jews were sent to concentration camps in the aftermath of that violence. So violence against Jews was a central piece of Hitler's racial war. It's veiled violence until the outbreak of the Second World War, and then with the invasion of Poland in September 1939, it becomes more widespread. With the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, it's systematic so-called action squads, four groups, several uh, hundred each, which follow behind the troops as they invade the Soviet Union and murder, by the fall of 1941, are murdering men, women, and children who are Jewish. In the few minutes I have left, I want to survey really quickly the implications of January 30th, 1933 for Europe. That far in the sketch term movies. Here's what Europe looks like in 1933. Germany highlighted. So this is Germany when Hitler takes office. The set of independent states. This is how it looks in 1939. The differences before the war begins. Austria is gone. It's been incorporated into Germany. And the Czech half of Czechoslovakia has been absorbed into Germany. So there's been substantial addition <coughs> territory right here. And then a series of invasions. Poland in 1939. In 1940, Denmark, Norway, the Lowlands, France, and prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union, this is what Europe looks like. It's transformed so that German-controlled territory sweeps right across the continent from Poland to the Atlantic, and the Germans take over the northern two-thirds of France here for strategic purposes. They're at war with Britain. France has been defeated and has accepted Treaty. And then these states, in the course of 1940-41, become allies of Germany, recognizing they don't have lots of choices. In the spring of 41, Germany invades Yugoslavia and Greece. So the conquest continues, and so this is what Europe looks like at the height of German power in 1942. This line was removed in 1942 beyond this. But in any case, this gives a pretty good idea. Germany controls from its front line. 1,000 or 1,200 kilometers into Soviet terrain, right across to the Channel Coast. It's allies all through the rest of Europe. And you can see there's not much left in terms of neutral territory. Sweden, Switzerland. And then, for reference to, you have looked at this before. This is Poland as it's carved up 
after the invasion, before the invasion of the Soviet Union, this territory was taken over by the Soviet Union in 1939. It's part of the deal with it. This was carved out to be a separate so-called general government, and this territory was annexed and became part of Germany proper. But what the map shows is where the literal death camps were. That is, those camps that were constructed for purposes of murder. Not as labor camps, not as holding camps, but as camps where those who arrived were sent to gas chambers. And finally, this is what Europe looked like after the Second War, the emergence of the Cold War. Hitler said one of his essential life purposes was to destroy Bolshevism, that is, the Soviet or socialist regime, and all the influences that came from it. The upshot, of course, of what he did was to move, if I can use the term Bolshevism, West significantly. The Iron Curtain, post-war period, runs there between the Warsaw Pact states tied to the Soviet Union and those of NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So the upshot of Hitler is quite unlike his objective. He's fabulously successful in the short run. He's an abject failure in the long term. So I said, do I have time? Yeah. 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 Take two yeah. minutes. How much? That's good. Oh. Well, we've got, we've got 15. That long. Okay. But if you want. I want to talk about propaganda for a few minutes. I said this was a central piece. This was a movement under a leader who recognized the power of image, of image creation, of image projection. One way to think about National Socialism is that it's the staging of political power. How do you make political power tangible? Something that people can relate to. Palpable. Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, appointed when the ministry was created in March 1933, said this, it's not enough for people to be more or less reconciled to our regime, to be persuaded to adopt a neutral attitude towards us. Rather, we want to work on people until they have capitulated to us, until they grasp ideologically that what is happening in Germany today not only must be, i.e., you're in trouble if you don't accept it, but also can be accepted. In another place, as part of this, he said, it's not enough that 50% of Germans support us. We want them all. We want them actually to believe. We don't want to be pushing back. Hitler was to say repeatedly, Germany, under his rule, was democratic. The democracies weren't democratic. How could he say that? Well, he said he had a popular following that no democratic leader could even approach. When he made his key moves in foreign policy in the 1930s, on four different occasions, he held plebiscites. That is, one issue votes yes or no. Germany left the League of Nations in the fall of 1933. A month later, that was in October, in November 33, a plebiscite was held, do you approve of? I forget the exact number, perhaps 96%. Later ones were 98 and 99% approval for his big moves in foreign policy. In 36, remilitarization of the Rhineland, the Anschluss, or the annexation of Austria in March 1938, he had, now there was some manipulation of the vote. And of course, when you're answering on a single issue, you have to be really opposed to be opposed. But nonetheless, he argued, this is a democracy compared to the democracy. I have the people who want to go where I'm going. Strange way of arguing, perhaps, but you need to be aware of it. What National Socialism did through propaganda, and let me pause again and just say, for those plebiscites, the propaganda machine went into overdrive. Needless to say. 
because it was a way of the regime saying, we do have widespread, almost universal popular support. It really mattered to them. But National Socialism was more than a set of ideas. It was a feeling. It was a faith. It had to be experienced through pageantry, through parades, through marching music, through flags, holidays, special commemorations. There was a whole National Socialist calendar created after 1933. Holy days, from which, of course, we get our word holiday. Holy days of the movement. The high holy day of the movement was November 9th, because that was the day of the fiasco putsch in 1923 in Munich. Sixteen National Socialists were killed in that fiasco when the police opened fire on the marchers in the center of Munich, and they became martyrs for the movement. Unbelievable panoply and pageantry and solemn commemoration was developed around those 16 martyrs. Special graves, public graves were created, two halls of honor on the square in Munich in the mid-30s. Midnight ceremony, torches, flags, smoke, speeches, great drama. I'm sorry I don't have really good footage in any of that. Any footage I had is just sort of washed out and it's difficult to capture, but it was powerful in the emotive qualities. The massive party rally each year started out as a weekend in the 1920s, but after Hitler came into office in 33, it turned into a week-long bash, a rock festival plus. Made Woodstock in 1969. Any of you ever watched the movie about Woodstock? Anyone here? Thank you. Woodstock was chaos and nothing compared to what the Nazis were able to stage for a week in Nuremberg each fall. And I'm going to show you a short clip in a second, so we get a sense. The key impulse in all this, interestingly, was Hitler. Goebbels was a main player, but the impulse was Hitler's. He was a man with an eye to spectacle. What would stir passion and what would capture the imagination? He designed the swastika flag for the party, designed the standards which you'll see here in a second in the clip. Strong operatic sensibilities. He watched certain operas by Wagner. That's a whole separate topic. He was a Wagner a fan. 30, 40, 100 times live in his life. And a very keen eye for how the stage worked, how music went together with the action, the depth of settings, so-called mise-en-scene. And that's what was staged each year in September in Nuremberg. And it's most famously captured in a film. Has anyone here seen Triumph of the Will? Nobody? That's interesting. A generation has passed, for sure. Because Triumph of the Will is potentially the most famous documentary ever created. Of the rally of 1934, it was completed after months of editing for release in 1935 about an hour and 45 minutes, something like that, in which the self-staging